Well, good morning, everyone. We'll wait till everybody gets in here. Uh, well, again, good morning. We have an epidemic uh, in Ohio. Uh, an epidemic as we're seeing more and more of our young people uh, starting to vape uh, at a younger and younger age. Uh, this has been going on long enough now that we know that many of them then transition uh, over to tobacco. Uh, and we know the long-term consequences uh, of, of that. Uh, Dr. Bode will talk in, in a moment uh, after Dr. Vanderhoff about what she is seeing out there, the science is, uh, and what the nature of this problem is and what the long-term impact uh, that will take place uh, in regard to these young people uh, who are starting down this pathway at an earlier and earlier age. Um, the ease of entry uh, into vaping and then into tobacco uh, is brought about by the flavors, uh, by the liquid that is flavored uh, for, the, for the vaping, and then, of course, by the tobacco uh, that, is, that is flavored. Which brings us to why we're here today. On December 15th, the General Assembly passed a bill that would prohibit local governments from enacting laws to discourage the use of tobacco. This measure is not, is not in the public interest, and therefore, uh, just a few minutes ago, I have vetoed this bill. There is the well-documented danger of tobacco products. I think we all know medical experts have been warning about the dangers of tobacco for decades. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, every year there are approximately 480,000, 480,000 deaths that are caused in the United States because of tobacco. They also report that annually more than $300 billion in healthcare spending and productivity losses are caused by cigarette smoking. Quite simply, the best way to prevent the health risk of smoking is, of course, never to start. The Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids reports that Medicaid costs caused by smoking in Ohio, Medicaid costs caused by smoking in Ohio amounts to $1.85 billion annually. Almost $2 billion this is causing taxpayers in the state of Ohio alone. Uh, we know that tobacco companies are adding flavors to tobacco products, tobacco products being not only cigarettes, but the vaping, uh, to make them more enticing to young people. A recent prevalence study on the use of tobacco among middle and high school students showed that two-thirds of the students who reported using tobacco products said they use them because, quote, they come in flavors that I like. Flavors, of course, including menthol. Uh, flavors including menthol help mask the harshness of tobacco, making it easier for young people to become addicted. That's true with cigarettes as well as vaping. Let me now invite uh, Dr. Bruce Vanderhoff, Director of the Ohio Department of Health, uh, to talk more about this problem. Doctor? Thank you very much, Governor. <clears throat> As you noted, tobacco use comes with very real costs to the people of Ohio. And also, as you noted, really the very best steps that we can take to ensure our young people have long, healthy, productive lives is to protect them, prevent them from suffering the ravages of tobacco and nicotine addiction. You know, the cost of tobacco use really can be measured in a variety of ways, and, and one of those is financially. Uh, the governor referenced some of the impact on Medicaid. Uh, you know, if you look at the country as a whole, between 2010 and 2014, it's estimated that fully 20% of Medicaid spending was attributable to cigarette smoking. And with Ohio's rates of cigarette use being 
higher than the national average, uh, you know, one would imagine that proportionally uh, that might be even greater here. Also, according to the Health Policy Institute of Ohio, after adjustment for inflation, the total annual health care cost attributable to cigarette smoking in Ohio is about $6.8 billion every year. But the most tragic measure of tobacco's impact on our state is its impact on human lives. Tobacco is the leading cause of preventable death in Ohio, responsible for more than 20,000 attributable deaths every single year. Now, fortunately, our state's efforts to address this are bearing fruit, and we've seen steady declines in tobacco usage over the course of the last several years, especially declines in smoking. But the battle is not won. There is still much more to do, and as I noted, our rates of cigarette smoking are still above the national averages. And while we're really grateful to see that youth smoking has also dropped and has now dropped to single digits, the reality is that, sadly, about a third of our high school students report either using e-cigarettes or vaping just in the course of the last 30 days. And make no mistake, nicotine products in any form are highly addictive and, when inhaled in the lungs, are potentially very damaging to the lungs, especially to young lungs. You know, the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, really applies here. And there's no doubt that efforts to prevent our young people from suffering from the scourge of becoming addicted to harmful tobacco products is certainly in everyone's best interests. Governor? Dr. Brandhoff, thank you very much. Let me now introduce Dr. Bodhi, uh, pediatrician, physician at Nationwide Children's Hospital, uh, who's going to tell us specifically about the dangers of tobacco and tobacco flavors for children. I might also note uh, that she uh, it deals with school-based care uh, and so is very familiar with what is going on uh, with our young people in schools today. Doctor? Thank you, Governor. As he mentioned, I'm a primary care pediatrician at Nationwide Children's Hospital, but I also direct our school health services program and work with youth in many of our schools, both locally here in Columbus and across the state. So one thing to note to start is that we know that the rates of vaping and e-cigarette use are rising in kids. And what we know is that rising in all categories. So this is not an issue that's specific to a certain area. This is an issue of concern in every single community in the state of Ohio. This happens in rural communities, urban communities. It is everywhere. We know that the rates of initiation of e-cigarette or vaping use are very high. They're more than double in high school students, as they mentioned, more than 30% of our high schoolers. And even more alarming, it's triple the rate now in middle schoolers. So we have our 12 and 13 year old kids that are also starting and introduced to these products at a young age. We know that nicotine is highly addictive, so as they start these products, it's very difficult for them to stop. Then we also know through emerging literature that as these kids get introduced to these products and are using them, they are much more likely to transition to tobacco products as they're young adults and into adulthood. So this wonderful trend that we've seen in a reduction in tobacco products is likely to revert as we get these alarming numbers of children that are getting introduced to these flavored products. When we talk to kids, when we survey kids that are initiating with these vaping products and we talk to them personally, their number one reason for trying this and starting it has to do with the flavoring. So these flavors such as candy flavors, fruit flavors, menthol flavors, the way they're marketed, they're very enticing to young people to go ahead and start and it makes them seem more safe. They are marketed to look like a product that a kid would try and use. That's very concerning to us. 
Also, this flavoring is meant to taste really good, sugary. It, it masks the harshness of the nicotine, so it also makes it easier to consume more of this product. So again, we are really setting ourselves up for a continued epidemic in our kids with these products, and that's why the flavoring is so important to be eliminated from not allowing this to be marketed to children or, or put into these products to start with. Um, and so that's really our biggest concern. We know that these kids are starting earlier, they're getting addicted, and then this is causing incredible long-term health outcomes for these kids. And many of them that I talk to have tried to stop. But again, this is a highly addictive substance, and so it makes it difficult for these kids to, again, be able to stop and revert back to not being a smoker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one final comment before we get to, to questions. I, I fully understand the desire of merchants uh, to have uniformity throughout the state of Ohio. I think that is a desirable uh, thing, uh, and I talked about that before. Um, candidly, though, we're dealing now with young people's lives. Uh, and when a local community wants to make the decision uh, to ban these flavors to protect their children, uh, we should applaud uh, those decisions. Uh, again, uniformity is, is important, uniformity is desirable, and the easy way, candidly, for us to get uniformity in regard to this issue, uh, the flavoring of tobacco, the flavoring of e-cigarettes, the easiest way to do that, it seems to me, is to have a statewide ban uh, of flavored cigarettes and, and flavored vaping. Uh, if we had that statewide ban, uh, Ohio would be moving forward. Uh, we will save a lot of lives. We will save a lot of children uh, from starting down a pathway that in 20 years, 25 years, 30 years may end up costing them their lives. So this is a veto that I did not take lightly. I don't take any veto lightly. Uh, I understand the desire for uniformity, uh, but we're dealing with children's lives here. Thank you. Governor, uh, did you object to any other provisions in 513, the taxing provisions, for instance? Well, you know, I never even got beyond that, beyond the flavor. The flavor was such so important to me that I did not even get beyond that uh, quite, quite, quite candidly. Governor, you're, you're interested in a statewide ban on flavored tobacco. Is this the first anyone, anyone is hearing of this, or have you talked to lawmakers about this in the past? Have you reached out to lawmakers? I, I, look, I, 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 I've made it clear uh, to, to some members uh, of the General Assembly uh, my opinion in regard, and it's not my opinion, it's the facts in regard to flavored uh, cigarettes and vaping. So, uh, you know, I've not specifically uh, May have had that discussion with any legislators in regard to a, a statewide ban. I'm just looking at this from a logical point of view, and I listen to my friends who have businesses, and I, I understand their desire to have uniformity, and that you know they could be at a competitive disadvantage. And I just think, look, the easiest way to do this uh, is to have a statewide ban, and we'll have the uniformity, we'll remove the issue, uh, and we'll also protect kids throughout throughout the state of Ohio. Anybody else? That bill would have wiped out a lot of other local tobacco control policies. I mean, did, did you have strong feelings about those as well as, you know, about market saturation and point of sale inspections? And, uh, as I said, I've not, really I've not really looked at those other areas. Uh, I, you know, my criteria in judging that will be public health again. Uh, and so I'm not going to prejudge any of those, but, um, you know. The more we can do to slow people down from uh, starting down the pathway. Uh, I mean, what is particularly egregious about this is that we know that flavors are really the entry point. Uh, and if you didn't have the flavors, uh, many of these young people could never start. And if they never start, they're never going to become addicted. We also know how difficult uh, it is once someone becomes addicted uh, to nicotine to stop. I mean, we, we've seen this uh, time and time again. People just have a very difficult time doing that. So if we can protect our young people under age 
uh, from starting down this pathway, uh, that certainly is something that we, we should do. It's, uh, it's, it's the right, again, the right thing to do. Does this set a precedent moving forward for other legislation, for example, gun legislation? No, what, I've, what, I've, what I, I was going to be very careful today, what I said. Um, you know, I think we judge each one of these individually. And, uh, you know, uniformity in state law it, it makes sense. And generally makes, some, makes sense to have uniformity in regard to the sale of products. But uh, this case is just so strong. Uh, and you, you weigh the, the uniformity, desire for uniformity versus, versus safety and public health, um, you know, this one is, is pretty clear. Governor, you have HB 507 on your desk. It will expand drilling rights in state parks uh, and redefine natural gas as green energy. Do you plan to sign it? Uh, I'm still looking at them. I think we have uh, a handful of bills left. We've worked our way through over 40 of these, I think, so far, or close to 40 so far. And, uh, uh, stay tuned. More, more will be coming. So, Governor, it sounds like home rule was not one of the issues you were considering when it came to this veto. Well, home rule. Look, I mean, I think you know that goes into the scale. Uh, you know, normally it's a question of home rule on one side uh, versus you know the value of uniformity. And I think, as you can tell from how I've come down on these, in some cases I come down on one side, and in some cases I come down on another, uh, I don't find that inconsistent. I, I think that home rule is important, but also uh, it's important that uh, in the sale of products we have some, some uniformity, at least throughout the, throughout the state. Governor, what's next if the General Assembly overrides your veto? I'm sorry? What's next if the General Assembly overrides your veto? What's well, the same thing. It's what's next on everything. If the General Assembly overrides any veto, uh, they override it. You know, they have the, the right in the Constitution to do that if they, if they would want to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's safe to assume you'll have a flavor ban in your budget. I'm sorry? It's safe to assume you'll have a flavor ban in your budget. Okay. We're still working on our budget, so we don't, you know, don't have any final decisions on the budget yet. That's uh, a, a work in progress. So. So I'm, I'm sorry, have I, have I what? Been subpoenaed. No. Are you anticipating no. being subpoenaed? Governor, your office has House Bill 452. There are two amendments in there. One would prevent twinning of two tax credits for affordable housing units, and the other would change how those properties are assessed. Do you plan to hire any of those or other pieces of it, Look, as I said, we're taking these bills. We're working our way through. We're most of the way through. We've got a few bills left, and we'll be... Uh, telling you what we're doing uh, when we do it, so you know, we're we're trying to get them to, trying to get them all done. Do you expect any other vetoes to come? I don't know. Anybody else? Governor, what's your opinion of uh, New Hampshire Speaker Stevens and how you think that vote will reverberate? Well, this is a decision obviously uh, been made by the members uh, of the House. Uh, I congratulated him uh, in, a, in a phone call message that I left with him. Uh, look forward to working with them. Did you talk to Derek and Mary as well? No, I'm not. Governor, you have an elections bill from your desk. Do you plan to sign or veto it? Uh, same answer. We, we were working our way through these bills. So, uh, the legislature was very, very busy, as you know, at the, at the, at the last uh, 24 hours so, yes, of their does, session. Does, so. does the health director have the authority to do a ban the uh, regulation? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. My guess is the answer is no. Doctor, do you know? I Doctor will put on his legal hat now. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I don't know the answer, and uh, that's that's something I would have to work with our legal department on. Um, Governor, going back to the question about the speaker, um, do you perceive this session having more challenges than previous ones just because of the sort of the, the, the competing factions within the majority party? No. No, I mean... Look, there's, there's, you know, in our constitution, there's a, there's a balance, uh, and there's a role for the speaker, and a role for the house, a role for the senate, a role for the governor, and that's spelled out in the constitution. Uh, I've been very, uh, you know, 
happy with my relationship with the General Assembly. Uh, if you look at our budgets, uh, and we're getting ready for, to give them another one in the next, uh, propose another one in the next uh, you know, few weeks, uh, I've been very happy with what we've been able to get through. We've gotten through, I think, about 97%, 98% of what we've proposed in these budgets, and so been very, very happy. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll continue and look forward to working with the two leaders and others. Have you had conversations with Stevens or any of the other lawmakers about how uh, his election could influence the Ohio Redistricting Commission? No. I have not. We got time for one more question. Anybody? Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much.